All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, as you can see, my name is Kyle Westhouse. I'm a student at Ohio State University. And I'm going to discuss what a dedicated 19-year-old with uh, about 60 bucks and uh, some free time and a passion for uh, cybersecurity can do with uh, specifically the easy pass transponder. Before I begin, just uh, in general, when you're uh, working with radio frequency signals, especially the device that I'll be using to output the harmonics, um, just make sure if you're playing around with stuff that you don't uh, output on a spectrum that's uh, legal because you will get in trouble with the uh, communications uh, governor. Um, I'm going to talk about the possibility of cloning other people's transponders, and so that's illegal. Don't do that. Attempting to circumvent toll payment is also legal. Uh, if you will get caught eventually, I can talk a bit more about methods you might get caught in the future. Um, if you are going to output with devices you can, um, which you're not sure what they're going to do, you can use Faraday cage uh, to make sure you're not breaking other devices around you, which is basically just put everything in an insulated box wrapped in uh, completely metal if you don't want to break the devices around you. All right. Uh, some, so some of the goals of this presentation. Um, so reverse engineering is sort of uh, the skill of our discipline, maybe, and so I'm going to apply that to uh, radio frequency communications, walk through the process of uh, reverse engineering a well-known device, um, show some tools that have been developed uh, in recent years and how it can be applied, and then uh, provide some background specifically about how that applies to the toll booth world and just some background on how uh, all of that process works. So. Again, these are the things I'm going to cover in this presentation, assuming uh, that I don't run out of time. So I'll start with the background of EasyPass, get into some past research that's been done by other people, um, and then I'm going to go through uh, the process that I went through to reverse into this device. So there's going to be a um, bit of electrical engineering in this. You don't need to understand all of that to understand the implications and the importance of it, but I think it's uh, useful to show the reverse engineering process. I'll show the Dissecting the packet and the protocol that EasyPass uses. I'll talk about uh, transmitting and interacting with the system, um, some tax conclusions, things like that, and then I'll take questions at the end. Right. So, what is EasyPass? Uh, it's a toll booth group uh, that covers most of the eastern United States. So, there's um, it was formed uh, in 1990 um, to sort of unify lots of smaller groups that were forming in the eastern United States and uh, make sure that uh, the states were interoperable as you can drive through different states and use the same device. Uh, the, sort of that infographic on the right uh, shows that essentially it's a device you would put on the windshield in your car, you drive underneath of a reader, and then uh, it is scanned in order to uh, um, determine your account and uh, charge the appropriate toll amount. So specifically uh, for the EasyPass system, they use uh, transponders that look like uh, in the left picture, and I have one here for Ohio, um, and that's what the currently in Ohio the, the, the gantries that you drive through uh, they still have uh, humans in them, and but uh, the fast lanes all have those. You can sort of see just above the truck on the right. There's that rectangle that's the actual uh, reader. So the toll, the toll booth world is sort of uh, changing protocols right now because in uh, 2012, um, uh, President Obama signed the Moving Ahead Progress Act, and it, like basically the last paragraph of that little act um, said that um, uh, it's wanted that uh, for a toll booth companies to move towards like a national protocol or at least uh, national interoperability. Basically, uh, they want at some point. All different parts of the nation to support um, each uh, transponder device. So that's what um, all the supported protocols looked like when that was introduced to us as well. Um, they narrowed it down to three protocols, um, and since then it's sort of been narrowed down further. EasyPass is the largest of those uh, protocols, taking up the purple at the upper right, when, which uh, as 2018, there's 35 uh, million transponders in the EasyPass system, uh, which is certainly uh, lots of activity and data to process. 
These, so uh, I mentioned that they are sort of paring down the protocols that they want companies to use in the future. This is a comparison between uh, two of the, the ones that have become uh, most prevalent. The most notable difference uh, on the left side is the protocol that EasyPass uses. Uh, on the right side is a uh, new protocol that uh, some of the other states are going to use. Um, most of the notable difference is that uh, EasyPass system uses um, active transponders, which is they actually have a battery in them. And they do their own transmission. Um, the other uh, devices are passive, which means sort of sticker tags. They're smaller, um, and they work based on uh, modulating and you know, sort of reflecting back the, the reader uh, signal. Um, they're a lot smaller. <coughs> Something else that's important to notice between these protocols, uh, the EasyPass protocol doesn't support um, like encryption at the protocol level. It has to be at the application level. Um, but the 6C, the protocol on the right, does support uh, some static keys. So that's something to notice. Become useful. Uh, so since then, uh, things have been sort of changing. Um, just sort of condensed down to four like regional groups and. The goal of that interoperability act was to have uh, everything done by 2016, which uh, did not occur as predicted by many of the companies, but um, they're working on so, so things might change in the future, but this is uh, where things are at right now. There's been some past research uh, in this area. Um, Nate Lawson uh, gave a speech in the past at a conference uh, about um, basically reverse engineering a different protocol, uh, Fast Track, which, is, which uh, was the system used in California. They're now updating to a 6C protocol that was on the right in the last slide. Um, so he did some analysis of radio frequency, but also went deep into the actual device itself, the microcontroller, which is like looking up JTAG chip reading, that's a really in-depth and great presentation if you're curious about this stuff. He also uh, basically found that um, not only are these, are these devices scanned at toll booths, but also just generally along the highway, these devices are scanned in order to um, predict traffic flow and things like that. And the, that uh, basically he, what he said is that lawyers know that that's, that information is available and so FastTrack was subpoenaed occasionally to get information about people's whereabouts using uh, that highway track information. And then that second uh, presentation was given at DEF CON by a guy who goes as Puke and Monkey and talked about privacy implications of having all these different radio frequency devices in your vehicle. Um, so toll devices as well as many other um, devices that output RF in your vehicle can be used to track you. And so um, he basically modified his EasyPass transponder, hooked up a different circuit to it so that it, uh, whenever it was scanned, it would actually output a, a noise. So not only was it being scanned along the highway, but also uh, when he was driving to New York and it was going off at uh, a bunch of different intersections, uh, so, and he actually mapped out um, where that was occurring. So he, um, his, his argument was that that's a privacy violation, and so the NYCLU but it took attention to that. So that's some of the past research that's been done in this area. So originally, uh, this sort of challenge was given to me as part of the uh, interview process for uh, an internship. Um, so I was given the first two phases, which is to demodulate the RF communication of the easy pass, which basically means turn the radio frequency communications into ones and zeros. And then uh, phase two was to take those ones and zeros and uh, so reverse engineer, uh, write a script, and sort of output maybe he more human readably uh, the protocol. Phase three wasn't given to me, but um, that's sort of where I went afterwards because I was curious and that was my own research. And so the whole time I was sort of thinking, all right, well we can uh, we can sort of listen in on this conversation, but can we take an active role in it? And I'll discuss how we can do that later. So uh, this. Rate of frequency, uh, reverse engineering is important because our devices are everywhere and they're not always given the uh, most important focus uh, in terms of security. Sort of like uh, IoT devices, they're not always uh, the, uh, the most well known um, or biggest systems, so they might not be receiving the most security attention. 
And toll booths are um, a bit more interesting or a bit interesting of a device to uh, analyze because they're associated with money. And uh, but uh, if you want to attack them, you can save some money. It's not a uh, large scale, maybe, money operation, but still there's money associated with it. So that uh, brings interest. Uh, first step of uh, reverse engineering basically any uh, radio frequency device is all radio frequency devices have to be registered with the FCC if they're going to transmit. Um, and so that in, a lot of the information that they register is public if you go to the FCC website and type in the like, registration ID. So all that information is uh, posted up there, is um, sort of listed uh, generally, and probably the most important of that information is at the bottom of the modulation type, which basically is um, going to describe precisely how the binary data is converted to this radio signal, uh, how you're going to take that radio signal and work back to the binary data. Uh, easy pass, specifically these transponders, uh, which I showed here, are manufactured by a company called Catch. So, um, part of uh, reverse engineering in general is doing your research a lot of the time. And, um, so, I went to uh, the manufacturer website and browsed around and saw what I found and found the marketing inf information for this specific uh, type of transponder that Easy Pass uses. Result, and there's a bit more information there, more hints and clues beyond what was on the uh, FCC ID page, including maybe um, the, the packet size and uh, the, the data format, so how um, binary data is going to be uh, processed even before it's put into um, the, sig the signal, um, and then some more information about the signal, including data rate and the protocol name that we can look at. Um, so that protocol. Um, I began searching for uh, that because that looks interesting. And uh, this is on the Easy Pass group. They have a uh, page for basically to work with these other uh, told with companies that they're trying to integrate with. And on that page, there's some helpful information. And as you can see, there's a link for the TDM specification. It comes to the CAPS page. It's a username and password, but uh, the protocol is actually open. So you can register uh, if you're a company or an individual. Um, so if you uh, look at the license, the license is basically uh, completely open as long as you register with them. And also, um, the company that I was um, doing this project for provided it with me, so I didn't have to spend time waiting for them to respond. <clears throat> so, the specification has uh, lots of helpful information. Um, so if you're going to be reverse engineering other devices, you might not always have the specification. Um, but this was a good place um, to start, and uh, now that I've gone through all this process, um, it, it would be definitely be possible to reverse engineer devices without specification. This sort of just helps with uh, the timeline and moving quickly. Um, but there's lots of uh, important information in, in the specification. It basically just sort of you know, refines those other hints and clues that we saw in the uh, FCC ID page, and the uh, manufacturer information. So I'll go through sort of all of these and, and I explain how it's helpful. Listen before a talk basically means that, like I said, this is an active transponder. Um, so it outputs its own signal, but it doesn't just uh, send out a beacon every once in a while. It, it waits until it's near an actual easy pass reader. This is uh, the specification for the communication sequence. So as you can, like I said, it's listen before talk. As you can see there's a, there's a trigger pulse by the reader. Uh, there's an optional. Uh, beacon with a, a bit of information, and then basically transponder uh, sends one packet, reader sends one packet, and uh, that's it. So it's, it's a very simple, and um, very quick, uh, which is important when vehicles are moving fast by to make sure that uh, everything happens in the time that the vehicle passes by. What is the what's the basic range of that anyhow? Well, I mean, in terms of distance? Yeah, so uh, about 100 meters. So that's when it starts reading about 100 meters out, you think? Yeah, so when I was, yeah, so when I was like detecting captures, you can see it sort of start to grow in strength, and the transponder would start to respond, and it would respond for a little bit while it was in the range. Also mentioned is the frequencies, which is uh, for both the reader and the transponder, which is helpful because it uh, gives us information about where to search for um, with our uh, listening device. Just generally, that's within the, the radio band for location monitoring services. Um, the range of an RTL-SDR, which is 
that uh, SGR stands for Software Defined Radio, just a, a device that you can tune to listen to uh, many different uh, frequencies. It is 24 to uh, 1766 megahertz, so uh, 915 megahertz is uh, pretty smack in the middle of that range. So the SGR, RTL SDR specifically will be able to uh, listen, be helpful. Uh, modulation type has also been uh, shown in many of these pieces of information. Um, if you're not familiar uh, with modulation in terms of uh, radio frequency information, there's a couple different types shown up there. And amplitude modulation, basically, um, based on like the information wave at the top, that's how you're gonna um, basically have the out the on globe, it's called the carrier wave, so you can see as the top wave rises and falls, so does sort of the, the outline of the bottom wave. The middle one is frequency modulation, so the frequency of the signal changes based on uh, the data wave. And then digital modulation is shown on the right because you don't always want to show, or you don't, you're not always wanting to um, transfer information uh, that's an analog. If you just want to, uh, if you have binary data that's shown at the other right, um, then that's going to be Different. So that's frequency modulation, is basically uh, two values for that top wave. And then on off keying, which is specifically what uh, the transponder uses for easy pass, um, is either the signal is on for one or it's off for zero. So uh, it's quite simple, um, which again uh, sped things up in terms of uh, making appropriate tools to uh, demodulate this information. Uh, Manchester encoding, it was specified in the data format, and what that um, essentially is, um, instead of just outputting a one for one and a zero for zero, um, you're going to combine the data with a uh, sort of uh, constantly changing signal that acts as sort of a clock signal so that um, the responder and uh, transponder, or the reader and the transponder uh, stay in sync. So every bit period is going to have a transition, which makes it easy to detect when that bit period is. And one starts high and goes low, and zero starts low and goes high. Um, so that's how, that's, um, if we see a one and a zero, that's act, we have to decode that first to one, one uh, before we can look at the packet data. So tools, I mentioned the uh, RTL SDR that's uh, shown on the left there, hooked up to Raspberry Pi, and I have mine uh, right here. It's just a small USB device that you uh, plug your computer, hook up an antenna, and then there are uh, open source programs that you can use uh, to listen to uh, varying frequencies. The new radio, that program shown on the right, is uh, open source uh, software to really uh, work with anything related to radio frequencies in terms of processing it, creating data, and uh, sifting through data. I'll show uh, some use of those tools later. GQRX is the program that I use that works with the RTL SDR um, to capture uh, the raw radio, uh, radio uh, frequencies that are going on. So uh, that uh, colored data there, that you know, blue, yellow, and red, is um, the actual radio frequency spectrum. And from left to right is um, the frequency domain. So left is lower frequencies, right is higher frequencies, and then as it moves up, um, it's uh, increasing in time, or going forward in time, and uh, transitioning to red colors means that the signal is stronger there. And uh, This particular image is captured uh, around 90 megahertz, which uh, if you're familiar with radio frequencies, that's basically um, FM radio, which you might listen to in your car being transmitted, uh, which is uh, uh, FM frequency modulation. Here, can you go back to that slide for a second? Yes. I see that it says uh, Berlin radios. Does that mean you were capturing uh, radio traffic from a station that was in Berlin? No, this is this is not my screenshot. This oh, is okay. I, said, um, I liked the uh, information they were showing there. So no, this, this, that would be that would be a feat mm -hmm. to get something from uh, across the, uh, the ocean. Yeah. That's some big antennas here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, um, the information that's actually being recorded when you're running that utility and saving things to a file is called IQ data. And so essentially you're recording a value for uh, the electromagnetic spectrum at that point in time. 
Um, so I and Q um, is basically a way to express the amplitude and also uh, like the angle of um, the spectrum at that point. So signal, signals that you're actually going to receive, signals as they are transmitted, are a real, like, uh, are a real number, uh, but they can be expressed um, as a combination of complex signals. And so a lot of, a lot of the processing um, is going to make use of uh, complex uh, numbers and a lot of math using complex numbers um, in order to process and get things the way you want it before when you're transmitting or to process it um, back to data. So basically, that picture at the upper right shows a projection of at the bottom right, which is the bottom right is a complex signal showing um, it's got both amplitude and phase angle going through time, um, but when projected as it would be transmitted by a device, you know, it appears real. That was very confusing for me to try and understand. Um, there's, a, like I said, there's a lot of electrical engineering that goes into this. There's um, Trying to search for stuff online sometimes resulted in a lot of advanced math that was, uh, confused me for a bit. But certainly, just after uh, being relentless and trying to understand it, um, there's a lot of sim uh, simpler explanation pages that help. So this is um, that uh, information that was captured to a file. This is a utility that you can open up a uh, file in in order to uh, check it out. Um, so uh, time is going from left to right, and then frequency is um, starting low at the bottom, going to high at the top. Basically, this is uh, an easy pass transaction occurring. Um, so if you remember, uh, going back to the slide that had the uh, communication sequence, there's a trigger pulse, easy pass responded, and then um, the reader responded with uh, new information. Uh, that pulse at the upper left um, that pulse at the upper left there is the trigger pulse and then uh, this little line here that's surrounded by data on the side is the transponder responding um, and all of this information that occurs on the side is um, basically a byproduct of amplitude modulation uh, that's occurring um, but definitely the center line is where we expect it in the frequency domain based on um, the information in the specifications. We know that that's the transponder responding. And then uh, this section here is uh, the reader responding um, in the same fashion with lots of uh, information on the side because of amplitude modulation. And then something interesting that occurs here is that we see something that looks like the transponder uh, speaking up again. So this isn't detailed in the specification at all, but what I found is that EasyPass um, basically responds again to show that it understood the information properly from the reader. Um, and if, if it's not correct, then the, uh, the reader will, if something, if the device itself sort of uh, has some errors in demodulating the data, basically. What? It's like a pack. Yes, yes. Now that view is reversed from GQRX. Yes, yes. It's the, uh, yeah, DQRX is sort of flips. Time is left to right instead of top to bottom. That is correct, yes. So, I mentioned new radio earlier as uh, the utility that I would use to process this information. Um, there's lots of tutorials online on how to work with this, and I, I probably uh, the biggest time that it took me for the, the first <coughs> project was uh, here in terms of trying to figure out how to get that information that I could clearly see was uh, the EasyPass uh, communicating and trying to get it to uh, binary data. So there's lots of different steps here uh, shown this chart and um, it's a bit detailed to go into but there's plenty of tutorials online where you can uh, talk to me afterwards if you want to learn more about this. Um, but there's a couple different steps uh, in here including uh, if, if you're not familiar with some RF word, um, centering the correct frequency, and then a low pass filter, um, and then convert, basically finding that outline of the wave that we showed earlier, and amplitude modulation, there's uh, special ways to do that, uh, which is made easier by the fact that, uh, like I said, this device 
on off key, so it's either on and transmitting or off and the signal is uh, less for a second. Um, and then there's um, so each of these blocks uh, performs a different function, and you sort of chain you chain them together to and then output data <coughs> at the end. And so there's a, a, a graph at the end, and then also outputting uh, to file. This is uh, sort of the, some of the graphs that are produced when you process this data. So up at the top is a fast Fourier transform graph, um, which basically a frequency spans from left to right, and then strength uh, of the signal in terms of decibels is shown from the bottom to the top. So you can see there's a and that green is um, that's like what the maximum value was over the over um, the length of the file. So you can see there was a big spike. All right, we're expecting it to be in the middle that a trans, uh, communication occurs. And then at the bottom, that's uh, basically signal strength over time. And you can see uh, the first little blip that occurs in front of uh, both of those like, sequences is the interrogation pulse of the reader. And then the second uh, longer and wider uh, thing is the actual communication occurring. So. Uh, FFT, basically, uh, there's some processing to get it to that graph. The reason it's helpful is because um, that graph on the left shown up there is amplitude modulation uh, with noise. If you're just looking at the signal itself, and it looks really random. But if you take a fast Fourier transform, you can see that there's noise going on the bottom row, but still the, the actual signal itself, uh, the amplitude modulation really um, shows up in addition to other uh, more complex reasons. This is uh, after a bit more processing, uh, and basically this is showing the reader and the tra uh, transponder uh, sort of on one graph. Um, so up at the top there, the blue is the reader, and then the, uh, the red is the transponder, and that matches the communication sequence that we've seen in all the other events as, ex as expected. Uh, so I got to a point where um, I was uh, stuck at almost um, the data that I wanted, which would be basically clearly showing the Manchester encoding I was showing earlier. And so this is looking at the top of one of those ride, uh, wider rises that was showing earlier. I can see like those uh, you know, uh, alternating like ones and zeros. Um, so that, that was, I was stuck there for a while, that was tantalizing. But eventually, um, after looking at up tutorials, I was able to work through it. And there we go. So that's um, the, basically the binary data. Um, in terms of the radio signal, uh, at least shown after some processing. So that, that was a very exciting to get to that point. Uh, what, uh, what program are you using for your uh, DSP analysis? This is, uh, this is New Radio. This is a graph produced by uh, New Radio, that open source program I mentioned earlier. So it, um, there's lots of uh, processing and output that it can perform. So the next step, um, after obtaining uh, get, at least getting to this point, is uh, recovering the clock, um, how often the bit period is occurring, which we already know based off of the, the FCC information and the protocol, um, but basically getting a program to detect when, when each uh, bit period is. Uh, basically how it works, um, what these two graphs show is that uh, it performs, um, takes the derivative of the, the signal and it tries to find where the derivative is zero because that is um, where the signal is at a peak, and then it's gonna, you know, it's rising up to that peak before and it's dropping afterwards, so that's the peak of the, the period. Um, so th this is um, basically all performed in one block that you just have to pass some parameters and uh, put it into the link and then pass the information on further. Um, so the, um, uh, an issue that I ran into is that uh, the, the reader, the antenna that uh, is basically placed over the lanes. It's uh, very powerful and strong. It showed up clearly, uh, but the transponder, uh, comparatively, uh, can be pretty weak. Um, so, at first, I thought, based off of uh, some of the graphs I was seeing earlier, that the reader was going to be too strong. It was overpowering things. So I captured it at sort of a lower gain setting on my uh, SDR, um, the basically uh, not amplifying it. But because of that, the transponder wasn't strong enough. So um, Based on, I made some captures while well, uh, uh, the nearest um, toll booths to us are along the Ohio Turnpike, which is uh, sort of goes across the northern part of the state. So I made some captures one day while uh, up going up from Thanksgiving break to see family, and that stayed up north. Um, and then uh, 
figured out some of this, and then on the way back down, captured again. Um, <laughs> this time with a bit more, a bit more, you know, more information. So as you can see, just that like very small little rise next to the peak um, is the transponder communication in the middle, and it's fairly low noise levels. So that's that's uh, we're not going to be able to get much out of that. Um, but this is uh, much better. So this this is actually one of the the captures um, that was uh, originally given to me, though I um, basically used my own or, or captured my own to uh, make sure I was understanding things correctly and it could be done. Um, but in the middle is the reader, and then on the sides is, is the transponder. You can see the transponder is definitely a little noisier because that's uh, it's scaled up to fit that size, but it's definitely um, a lot better after capturing that uh, amplification. We actually have something to work with there. So at this point, um, after doing all that new radio work, got everything demodulated. So we have binary data. Um, it's unpacked into you know, the Manchester encoded, and Manchester encoding, and there's um, basically a, only a half bit per byte. But we have a file with the information uh, that we need if we can process it. So at this point, um, Stepping away from uh, new radio, this is more about uh, processing the packet, which I did with some uh, C++, because that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, so uh, I wrote a script basically to cut transmission down to the specifically um, uh, the actual communication sequence, and I convert that Manchester encoding um, in bytes all the way down to bits. So it's just uh, 256 bits, 32 bytes is one packet. Um, and then based off that information, we're going to dissect it according to uh, the protocol. So in that specification uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, it specifies a couple different uh, sections. Uh, like you can see there's factory fixed, agency fixed, there's some, then there's the act sections that actually uh, change each time, and there's a, an error correction code at the end, and that, I'll leave that uh, on the right, just a picture of a file I made as I was reading through the specification to sort of clearly map out in my mind. Um, where to expect everything. Numbers milliseconds, I think. Uh, on the left? Uh, the top. The little arrow. Oh, yeah. Uh, those are, that's bit length. Oh, okay. actually. Um, so, um, part of the specification is that um, the manufacturer sort of set some fields as fixed, um, but some of the um, sections are, it's up to the agency to decide how it's going to be used. Um, so that's listed there. And so that's one of the sections with variable length because of that. So basically, uh, Easy Pass as a group has decided what some of the sections are going to be, and all the subgroups, all the states within it have to um, use the spec according to that. Um, so the, uh, I was trying, so Sorry, this, uh, the specification listed some information, but there's those reader programmable sections as well that I uh, specified. So I was searching through, uh, again, that research aspect, trying to comb through everything I can to find uh, more. And so um, uh, searching through the sitemap, um, there's an easy pass, again, a document that's posted for um, to help uh, with uh, combining with other toll agencies that lists uh, basically for every like toll en entry and exit point along uh, all the um, turnpikes, there's um, there's like an agency code uh, for basically each state that it's in, and then there's like a plaza code um, for that point, and then it, it lists the latitude and longitude. But the most important thing is there's a, a plaza code that we can start searching for um, in the data. Oh, and they actually have strings in there. Um, the 31 character. Oh no! This is uh, this is describing uh, just like in, in this file itself. This is, ah. this is actually in the package, but um, this is just yeah, this is just a file that they use to understand some of the information. Um, this this isn't actually specifying like what's in the packet, but there's plastic codes, which we know that um, based on where the easy pass enters and exits, it automatically charges your account. So we um, assume that somewhere in that uh, information is going to be. Uh, entry and exit code. Other places to look for uh, information um, is there's uh, file descriptions that EasyPass shares um, for basically sharing files in between different states. Yes, for sharing uh, files in between the states. So there's information in there, uh, like 
uh, the scan time and things like that that we know must come from the transaction and we can look at, uh, start searching for uh, bit fields in the uh, transaction. So the, uh, the current state of uh, the dissector is that it automatically find packets within like a, a capture file. Um, and then split the packet into the different data fields, output it in readable forms. If there's an error code in the protocol, it's going to check that, make sure everything matches up. Um, correlate some fields to interpreted meaning, like one of the things that I found was that there's, a, there's codes for the vehicle type um, that I searched for and found within the packet. Um, and so I have captures from uh, Virginia and Ohio that uh, I confirmed that the show like the, the vehicle type um, but certainly um, other agencies can have other information in there. And then this utility can output test packets. So give me just a second. I can show the utility they have. So basically, uh, this is the program and there's the help page. There we go. There's uh, reading in uh, one of the files that I processed from the radio. Basically, we can uh, you can see here it's searching through the file, I'm trying to find uh, uh, ones and zeros in the, in the proper pattern and of the specific packet link. And if one finds it. Checks the error code, everything is correct, and then it uh, shows the different sections. Um, so, specifically, we can show this is an easy pass. Uh, this is a toll collection user, unit as opposed to like test units, uh, standard windshield map as opposed to some of the different types of transponders for like trucks and things. Um, it comes from Ohio. It shows the serial number, which um, matches up with what's listed just on the barcode of the device, so we understand what that is now. Uh, vehicle class, um, which that's listed in the document what that means. Um, and then there are some of the programmable blocks. I sort of ran out of time to uh, sort through all of the binary data uh, that's shown in there. I'll talk um, more later about how I, how I know that there is at least the um, plaza code, like what the entry and exit point in there, and also <coughs> um, the transaction time. Do you have the source anywhere for? I haven't opened the source yet. yet. I'll, I'll do that at some point after this presentation. I admit, I'll talk a little bit more about what this works. I'll talk a bit more about that a little bit. I'm going to find my position. All right, so uh, at this point, I sort of completed um, the first two phases that were sort of given to me, um, but um, something that sort of popped up that people might have made phase three, what I was talking about, possibility, is that uh, the same guy that released this RTL SDR, which is this really cheap listening device, found uh, basically a USB to VGA adapter um, that he wrote a driver for, and you can um, basically make an output since you're uh, writing to a screen, you know, uh, whatever you want, or whatever's on your screen, you, if you, you can, uh, it doesn't properly filter the digital to analog converter inside of it, and so it sort of uh, leaks radio frequency spectrum that you can completely control. Um, so this uh, was definitely interesting to me. It's about fifteen to twenty dollar device that you can buy, it's basically the transmit side twin of the uh, he calls it of the RTL SDR. So I went ahead and ordered one of those and uh, started to play with it. So that picture on the right. Is showing that the creator um, used it to imitate uh, GSM, which is uh, phone towers. Uh, and he did a couple other things, some other different phone protocols. He was able to spoof GPS, things like that. So, uh, while this is awesome, I can use it to uh, continue my research. With a VG. Yeah. Ironically enough, I was. Uh, <laughs> they told us we were going to present with uh, VGA here, and I only have um, HDMI on my laptop, and I was. Uh, um, I realized I have uh, the VGA adapter, but I can't use it because I'm using it for the demo and the presentation. That's what this is. Um, so I had to buy another adapter. But it turns out they have HDMI anyways. Well, the <laughs> RTL SDR a lot of times utilizes a sound card because of the frequency. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I think the high frequency of VGA, you know, frequency bandwidth of VGA is why they yeah. go cover that. True. Um, oh, yeah, yes. Uh, something else to mention based off that is, um, so it uses USB 3, which on, uh, is usually around, it only goes up to around 150 uh, megahertz or uh, million samples a second. But um, this device is, um, is properly filtered, so you can rely on harmonics in the radio frequency spectrum to output all the way up to um, at least where, uh, where GSM is, that uh, cell signal that the um, creator was transmitting was also in the 900 megahertz range, so that gave me hope that I could also use it. Um, so that, that's a picture on the right showing the harmonics across the spectrum. <coughs> So again, this is going back to that amplitude modulation that's shown, um, that's used in the protocol, and what we see is that basically um, how we get from, how we take the two signals and get to the bottom signal, the bottom, the modulated signal at the bottom, the mathematical process is basically this multiplication of the two signals together, um, that'll, because you're multiplying that top carrier wave, uh, basically it's just height, that's amplitude, uh, by the, the, the variance of the middle wave. So thankfully, that means that implementing this in new radio is going to be fairly simple. But for basically going the opposite direction from um, data to radio signals, this is the original readers that are used um, by the Easy Pass. On the left is like um, the big device that's in some of the gantries. But also, we've just been searching on their website and found that device on the right, which is like a, a pocket reader, I guess that they um, utilize for field work sometimes. So essentially, we're gonna. Um, Recreate that device on the right with uh, two uh, cheap little adapters for forty or so dollars plus, plus some extra. This is uh, the new radio code for basically um, going from the verse from data to um, radio frequency. Um, so the process was I, I take the data or the packet that I want to uh, broadcast and then put it through this uh, processing. Um, set of blocks, and then it outputs to a file samples that are going to go into the um, the Osmo FL2K. It's called this USB to VGA adapter, and then this will output uh, the appropriate radio signal, uh, radio frequency at a harmonic that we desire. So I adapted the uh, provided code um, just a little bit, nothing major, to basically add make it accept signed or unsigned data, and then um, patch it so that the creator already had the ability to um, output on uh, the, red, the red channel, the green channel, the blue channel, but only red was enabled, and I just uh, patched it to uh, try and increase output strength by outputting on all, on all three. Um, so this is the result. This is GQRX again, capturing our RTL SDR and showing uh, as you can see, there's uh, some information showing up for, uh, right in the area we want, 915.75. So this is just um, this is just some simple interrogation pulses showing up, uh, but successful. It's right where we want it to be. It's uh, the interrogation pulses we want, um, and this is the actual uh, packet being um, broadcast. One of, one of those pictures is from the Osmo FL2K. One of them is uh, from the actual EasyPass reader. Um, I asked, do you see the difference? Because um, we can pretty clearly see that um, it's modulating the information correctly and doing what we want. But the, in, uh, the difference that I know that you can't see the link of those two pictures is that um, one of those is captured at a different gain setting than the other. So the actual output strength of um, the Osmo awesome NFL2K is very weak. Um, so that's basically like scaled to the same level that was um, earlier, like much wider from the EasyPass reader. So that's uh, very weak, um, and because of that, um, that's with uh, basically a, a makeshift antenna hooked up, which is basically just shoving a jumper wire into port, and um, and uh, like I said, modifying it so the blasts on all three channels at once, and it's still only that strong. But thankfully, we can solve that. So I haven't actually uh, um, bought these devices yet or tested them. But on the left is a, a filter for uh, the specific frequency we want, and the picture on the right. Is a uh, amplifier. So uh, the filter is necessary because we're going to amplify the signal. Those harmonics are going to become even stronger. And they really are going to start transmitting in areas that you don't want to transmit in. Get some attention that you don't want. Um, but, so both of these devices are around twenty dollars. Um, so I mentioned forty dollars plus a bit more. You combine these devices so somewhere in the eighty dollar range. Um, 
you'd be able to completely imitate the easy pass system. Um, some sort of band pass filter on the output side. But yeah, that's what the device on the left is. That's, yeah, that's what I'm going to Yeah. So yeah. Um, so now we can completely imitate the system. What are the uh, what's the result of that? The protocol itself doesn't uh, protect against any replay. Um, it's basically capturing. I captured like you know two communication sequences in a row, and the the, the data that was on the transponder at the end of the first one is what it outputted in the beginning of the second one. So there's no time correlation going on or anything, so it's trivial to clone these devices. Uh, Lawson, who I mentioned at the beginning, investigated the California um, toll system, basically said that you know, this is uh, maybe interesting because, like you said, lawyers sort of sometimes subpoena um, that toll information to search for where people were. So if you want to pretend to be at a place you aren't at, uh, you can start writing um, your information to maybe a car that drives by, and you can say you were at this toll booth at this time. You couldn't have been committing this crime. So that was that was his interpretation of a, a clever possible attack vector. And something else you can do now you can completely write the exact bits that you want on your transponder. So you can test exactly how much data is verified by the reader. Um, you can maybe try using the uh, there's different application IDs you can use. There's one for like testing by the manufacturer. You can see if you're just not charged for that. Uh, you can see if the different transponder types um, are cheaper. Like if, uh, you can pretend to be a different vehicle class, maybe you get charged less. Um, also, I mentioned there's like the plaza codes, the entry and exit point. And start changing those and see if it verifies with what it was originally scanned or if it just trusts what's on the device um, to make it seem like you're only traveling. You know, one toll booth in, instead of you know six along the turnpike to save money that way. Um, so before I presented this presentation, though, this is uh, I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to get in trouble for sharing all this information. So that's why I call the slide alternatively the benefits of covering your ass because I call <laughs> um, Easy Pass and it's sort of hard to uh, express. Uh, I'm just a college kid and the research that I was doing and trying to find some of the people what was going on. But after four or five. Um, times being forwarded. I got to the head uh, tech manager at Easy Pass, um, one of the executives that's um, charged with basically all the tech. He was very knowledgeable and also very kind, very understanding, and very open to having a conversation with me, which was very relieving um, to me, make sure I wasn't getting in trouble. Um, and had a very knowledgeable conversation. So basically, Easy Pass is aware um, of basically the status of this protocol in the current world. Um, so the protocol was you know, enabled sometime in the 90s, and so it was being developed sometime in the 80s. So back then, there were this wasn't necessarily um, the, the utmost of interest to them in security. But since then, they have turned focus to it, and they, they are uh, aware that it's um, a very simple protocol. Um, basically, something else we discussed is, I, uh, so I mentioned I sort of ran out of time when I was working um, on the project um, as part of the internship. To, find some of the, or to completely um, search through those data fields, but like I said, there's those entry and exit points, and uh, the time basically confirmed. Um, those are both present in those reader programmable sections. So there's two reader programmable sections. Uh, one of them is used by, uh, specifically just like the, for toll information, entering and exiting those, and the other one, the other section is for those other devices that are gonna be scanning, like if you're just driving along the highway for a, uh, Yeah, traffic information, things like that. Um, they might change some of the information in there. Um, so, oh, um, also, so it was just interesting um, to hear basically an analysis of uh, some of the protocol decisions made from from the, the easy passes uh, viewpoint, why they chose things. Uh, essentially, um, they um, they understand the the protocol is simple, but they sort of. Um, they keep it that way because keeping it simple and having an active transponder makes it really easy to actually scan the device and make sure that it works in the time period that it takes for a car to drive by. Some of the, some of the other um, transponders that are uh, passive are um, less reliable in scanning or more difficult uh, to scan. You need to install um, uh, more expensive equipment to be able to read them properly. You need to install like, two um, gantries and overhead passes to make sure that devices are read properly. But when you have a simple protocol, um, and um, an active transponder that has its own battery. It's very easy to make sure that it's scanned properly and you don't have to rely on. Um, the other method that they use when uh, this fails is sort of backup, which is license plate scanning. 
So, um, encompassing that more, like uh, discussion of possible attacks with him is they rely on that uh, even though these devices work a lot of the time, um, they don't work 100% of the time. And so occasionally when you go through, it's not going to scan properly. Um, this happened to us when we were driving through testing it. I think because we like moved around immediately and the transponder didn't leave the zone. But basically, um, we, they just had the attendant scan, the attendant scan at that point. Um, but if you go through and it doesn't scan properly, then they rely on the license plate scan. So even if you're using a cloned one, uh, one, um, they're relying on that while well, the person can speak up and charges are going to their account and aren't theirs. And two, um, eventually uh, your device isn't going to scan properly at some point, and um, then they're going to go up the license plate, find out that your vehicle is wrong, and um, start searching it out from there. So uh, it is possible to clone and use these attacks, but um, basically confirm that they're mitigated uh, by a lot of these other um, things include like license plate scanning. It's a st statistical game and until you, you get caught and you're doing this. Well, um, <laughs> it is the police academy. <laughs> 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 I've got it. 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 I've um, it shows that the Osmo FL2K, this transmitting device, which is very recent, released uh, in the middle of uh, 2018, can work um, for protocols beyond just what the um, uh, creator showed. It can really be applied to uh, basically any protocol that you want, and it just lowers the bar to entry even more. That's really the most um, biggest takeaway from this presentation is that for, if you, you can combine uh, these two point dollars devices, and you, um, it just makes it even easier. Um, investigate any part of the RF spectrum, both in terms of knowledge and the money required uh, to attack a system and investigate a system. Uh, so yes, I understand it's uh, time. If you step out, I understand. Um, I'm glad I'm almost done. This is, um, okay, what, um, I was just uh, speaking with uh, Easy Bass and Zach, uh, basically I found also this, um, Someone else who had done concurrent research basically around the same time as me um, and released um, a tool that uses um, the Phil Economy of a company used uh, USRP, which is um, a, a type of SDR equipment which is more expensive. We basically wrote code to do uh, some similar stuff. But the USRP, um, what makes it different is because it's uh, more of a dedicated device, I uh, put MSRP up there because. It's more expensive, it's around six hundred dollars. So that doesn't necessarily it lowers the bar of entry um, lower than um, getting an actual easy pass reader itself, but uh, I still think what I've done is important because um, again it's much cheaper. But something interesting that he was able to do that device um, is uh, basically he didn't have to capture to a file and process the USRP can go off of uh, when it receives a burst on the transponder so it can sort of respond immediately instead of uh, writing things to file. And also, um, he, he went through uh, that specification that I did, but um, I went into a bit of the further analysis of the packet fields, and now I'm going to keep doing that until I uh, learn or make sure that I've got everything just because I'm curious. Um, so, like I said, further analysis of packet data might be important in the future. Um, Maybe combining all the functionality into one program instead of having GRC portions and code portions so that it's uh, more contained on one, one thing. Um, and that would allow combining uh, the receive and the transmit at the same time so that it's not two separate functions, it's a transceiver one. And of course, now that we've confirmed that these devices can work in tandem, you can reverse engineer other devices and protocols. Um, it would be interesting to see whether the Osmo FL2K, which is much more recent, is going to catch on, sort of like the RTL SDR has, which is. Uh, there's lots of tutorials online. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens with uh, toll interoperability in the future because they're sort of in flux right now with the different protocols. Um, they are something that's some, that I thought was curious is when looking at um, the future protocol they might use. They're, they're now um, they have a sort of a call for comments on basically security considerations. So I think they've seen some of the analysis that's been done and some of the 
like Jiffy Monkey was um, sort of bringing to the light the privacy considerations, and so they're, start, they're thinking about whether or not that needs to be changed in the future. Um, so the things I've learned from this, if you do enough research, you can piece together parts of a complex system and learn just about anything. Um, I, think it was, I think it was very interesting the ways that Easy Pass relied on mitigating um, the data, not necessarily relying on, relying on the protocol itself. So yeah, I went along, but if you have any questions, feel free to contact me or uh, uh, talk to me later during this conference. I'll be around. Um, yeah, do you guys have any questions? Yes. Uh, is this vulnerable to a replay attack? Like, would you be able to actively to put an active signal, get the uh, ID of another Easy Pass reader, and then like uh, clone it? Yes, you can. Uh, you can uh, trigger the other the other reader and then capture the information that's on it. Put that on your reader and then go to the toll booth before they do, mm -hmm. and then you sort of like stolen their information, and it's going to fail for the next time. Yes. So you said that thing actually stores state information that has ever come in and out of these various zones. Yes. Yeah. So there's uh, 250. Basically, the packet is 256 bits, and uh, that's what's transmitted every time. And so the reader just transmits exactly that 256 bit section to store. Um, so whatever that 256 bit section the output, it's going to store. Yes. Do you think the, the Easy Pass system cares that their transponders can be cloned at this point? Uh, versus the cost of repairing it, of mitigating. Um, Basically, my understanding of uh, talking with the exec is that they're aware of it, and uh, they they have done research into like whether or not it's a concern. And I don't think it's been prevalent at all, or um, it's not enough of an issue that it's causing any any issues um, for them. It, so, the, the discussion of the the cost of maybe updating um, the readers and the infrastructure was brought up in turn, uh, and during the conversation of like what's going to happen in the future as the protocols um, try and uh, become interoperable. Um, so that is something to cons uh, consider that updating is, is a considerable price, um, but I don't think that that's um, preventing them from turning reasonable eyes to this. They seem very well aware um, and seem to understand the likelihood of these attacks. Do you do any microcontroller programming, and what platform do you prefer? Uh, I don't. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> I haven't gotten there yet. I've got, got time for my last All right, check out the ESP8266. It's about three, four dollars. It's a full Wi-Fi capable chip, and it, you can program it using Arduino code. Mm -hmm. And I, my favorite C++. And it's good to see a young guy who's into C++. Is that pretty rare? Anymore?